Amen. Thank you. Be seated. chapter 17. While you're turning there, could I uh, get you to pray for something really specifically? I can't tell you what it is. It'd be one of those uh, kind of unspoken requests, but I just call it special. In order for the answer to this request to occur, God would have to move in five, six, seven different things and they would have to all occur within a definite period of time and they'd have to converge in order for it to occur. So that should stir your curiosity. <laughs> but I wish you'd just put down special and whatever you think of it, just pray for that because um, it's going to take a miracle of the Lord for it to occur. So now if you're in the uh, book of Revelation chapter 17, uh, we're in part two of the prophecy series and there will be a third part coming up down the road, but I wanted to kind of separate the prophecy series so that we'd have other things that I could uh, give you from the Word of God as well. But uh, we're going to look uh, in the 17th chapter, we're going to start off with just two verses. 
And uh, then I want to uh, focus on who is the harlot, the great harlot, the great whore. Uh, she's called the mystery Babylon, the great mother of harlots and abominations of the earth in verse 5. And I want to tell you who she is. And then tonight, I want to tell you who or what the beast is that she's riding. It'd be very important because it has a lot to do with what happens during the tribulation period. So Revelation 17, 1 and 2, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So then the angel carries them away, and he sees the vision of this woman riding on the beast. The question is, who is she? What is the beast upon which she rides? And the symbolism that we see in the book of Revelation, uh, the people in the first century would have caught it pretty quickly because uh, they didn't have a lot of written things that they could read, you know, books and things like that. So uh, they had to have things given to them in uh, memory-producing ways, and symbolism was one way to do that. So first century Christians would have gotten pretty quickly what John was talking about here in the book of Revelation. But for us, it's tougher because in order for us to get it, we have to have the same knowledge that they had of all the Old Testament prophecies. And we have to also have a knowledge of world history in order to understand. It. So Warren Wearsby uh, in the uh, Bible Expository Commentary, Volume 2, page 612, says this about her. He says, uh, this beast's, uh, this woman riding on the beast is worldwide religious system. It is a worldwide religious system, in the quotation. John Walbert, in his book, All the Prophecies of the Bible, page 585, says, this woman is the ecclesiastical Babylon or Babylon as a religion, end of quotation. Uh, J. Dwight Pentecost says, Revelation 17 outlines the judgment on the great harlot, the apostate religious system that exists in the tribulation period. That's in his book, Things to Come, page 364. It was my blessing to be able to study under each of these teachers and uh, know them in, in a semi-personal way. So the description and function of this woman links her to historical Babylonianism, and that's extremely important because historical Babylonianism emanated from the Tower of Babel account, and that's found in Genesis 11, and then from its corrupt leader, Nimrod, who is described in Genesis chapter 10. Babylonianism represents the fullest possible rebellion against the true God, Jehovah, as mentioned in the Old Testament. So from Babel to the present, from Genesis chapter 10 all the way to the present, most false religious systems have arisen out of some form of Babylonianism, and Warren Wearsby in his uh, commentary, Bible Expository Commentary, page 612, has an entire page devoted to that. I won't read it to you. But it should be no surprise then to us that during the tribulation period, a revived Babylonianism will reach maximum manifestation under the two beasts mentioned in uh, the 13th chapter of Revelation. The first beast chapter 13, 1 through 10, described he is the world power that comes up to a position of leadership, explains what happens in the rapture, and then begins to pull together the nations to stand together under his leadership. And the second beast, in the 13th chapter, also verses 11 through 18, is described as the false prophet. And what he does is he pulls together a lot of religious systems that are false and puts them together so that they actually support and promote the uh, not only the leadership of the Antichrist, but after three and a half years, they will promote the absolute worship of that Antichrist. 
So we're going to see, hopefully, in this message, <clears throat> how the false religious system will be integrated with a highly charged political system. And the wicked one, the man of sin, we call him the Antichrist, will seek total power over all the world. And when he has gained that power, he then will use the false prophet to help him set up himself in the temple uh, halfway through the tribulation period. And uh, he will demand worldwide worship. And he will give a mark called the mark of the beast to those who worship him. And those will be the only ones that can buy food and go anywhere. <laughs> so everything will be based upon your surrender. Now, you say, well, how do I escape that? Well, be sure you're saved and you'll be taken out in the rapture. And you won't even be here anyway. When the rapture occurs, you'll be gone. And uh, what's left down here will be the Antichrist trying to explain to everybody how millions of people suddenly disappeared and that he will do such a good job that he will gain uh, worldwide support. So what's going to happen is we're going to see an actual globalism under the control of the highest level of wickedness we've ever experienced upon the earth. Uh, presently in the uh, political arena, the Democrats are pushing very high for international globalism. In other words, instead of having individual countries who want everybody to be put together into one large arena. So there is an important warning about the book of Revelation that John Wahlberg presents in his uh, uh, All the Prophecies of the Bible. And I want to give this to you. We're not going to be able to do much with it this morning, but I want you to be aware of it. And let me give you his quotation. This comes from page 584. And here's what he says, quoting now. The book of Revelation was written in the order in which the truth was revealed to John. But the events described are not necessarily in chronological order. This is especially true of Revelation 17, which probably occurs during the first half of the last seven years. End of quotation. Now, there's a reason for that. Um, all prophecies related to certain persons and events have to be always studied supplementary. In other words, we have to put them together. In order for us to really understand Revelation, we have to really understand the book of Daniel, particularly chapters 7, 8, and 9. But when we see this image of Babylonianism, this uh, great whore, the, the fornicating uh, uh, woman riding on the beast, indicating all of the wicked religious systems of the world, we recognize that this must begin somewhere in the first part of the tribulation, and the reason for that is the 17th chapter uh, tells us that she is about to be judged. So she has to have been performing for a period of time in order for God to step in and bring judgment. When we look at the entire Bible when we're seeking to understand the end times. We can't just run to the book of Revelation and read it and expect to understand it. Revelation builds on Daniel, builds on Ezekiel, builds on Isaiah. And a large portion of it builds upon the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. So from Genesis to Revelation, all of the relevant factors have to be analyzed. Babylonianism is probably one of the best examples of why that approach is necessary. So I want to examine this harlot and the beast upon which she rides, but I want to do it separately. I want to focus on her this morning. And then we'll focus on the beast tonight. So if you're keeping an outline, number one, the harlot. That's what we're going to look at. John says in 17.1, the angel presented her as the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now the phrase, she's seated on the beast. But she's also said to be seated on many waters. And in the book of Revelation, multiples of waters refers to peoples and nations and tongues and and uh, all of that civilization. So basically, it's going to be a combination of a lot of national involvement here. Uh, her judgment is being announced, and this adds strength to, to Dr. Walbert's argument that the false religious system had to be established early in the tribulation because she's now, halfway through the tribulation, going to be judged. She will have acted in such a way in the first three and a half years as to require God to intervene in judgment. 
Warren Wearsby says in his Bible Expositor's Commentary, page 612, quoting now, The woman is the great harlot, but she is also the mother of harlots. The Babylonian system has, in one way or another, given birth to all false religions. She has also seduced men into opposing God and persecuting all of those who serve the Lord, end of quotation. Walbert, in his book, All the Prophecies of the Bible, page 585, says this, It is best to regard chapter 17 as the destruction of ecclesiastical Babylon. What he means by that is the actual church system itself that has become worldwide. Or it can not only be um, that, but he says also, and chapter 18, we'll, we get, we'll get to that at some point, will be the destruction of Babylon as a city rebuilt and as an empire, end of quotation. Now, if you have a copy of J. Dwight Pentecost's book, Things to Come, it would be very encouraging for you at some point to go to the section on uh, the first beast and uh, go to the section on the great harlot and go to the section on the, uh, the beast itself, and uh, you'll be able to see the time that he has put in, time and energy he's put into doing it. So what I want to do is I want to give you um, eight marks of the great harlot that J. Dwight Pentecost shows directly from the scripture. And I'll give you the scripture references so you can read it on your own. Number one, uh, it is so characterized as a harlot. Revelation 17, 1 and 2, we just looked at. But if you go to verses 15 and following, he says, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled and the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So while claiming to be the pure bride of Christ itself, this prostituted form of religion is now described by the Holy Spirit as a great whore fornicating with the kings of the earth. So basically, what we're looking at here is that all false religions claim to be true. The best way to sell error is to sell error as truth. The second thing that Pentecost says is this is a system leading the ecclesiastical affairs on the earth. And he quotes verse 2, which we read, but he also drops down to verse 5 and says, Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So basically, the fact that she has become a religious system which is not the real religious system and she's actually engaged in the political arena to help support the ungodliness of the Antichrist, the Bible refers to that as spiritual fornication. And spiritual fornication is described by Bible scholars as adhering to a false religious system. So it's character, she's characterized as a harlot. <clears throat> Number two, characterized as a system leading all ecclesiastical affairs. Thirdly, she is a leader in political affairs as well. Notice verse three. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, the interesting thing about this is when you see heads and horns mentioned in the Bible, context is extremely important. But to fit this context and the context in the book of Daniel, the, the, head, the heads and the, and the uh, horns have to represent kings and kingdoms in order for there to be an amalgamation of kingdoms in the end of the age. So... Uh, a leader in political affairs. So even though her primary focus is ecclesiastical, she has a direct influence on the political activities that are taking place. So it 
what is happening. It acts in a controlling fashion over the beast on which it sits. And when we get tonight to the beast, it'll be important to remember that. So here's this ecclesiastical organization uh, leading in political affairs by exercising strong influence over the beast upon which she sits. Number four, Pentecost says this, she accumulates wealth and great influence. Verse four, she accumulates wealth and great influence. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So she has great wealth. This church is wealthy. This church has a, a great amount of material resources that it can draw upon in order to help promote the beast, the antichrist, the wicked one, as John refers to him. So it accumulates wealth and great influence. Number five, according to Pentecost, she represents a phase of development heretofore unrevealed. Represents a phase of development heretofore unrevealed. Verse five calls her the mystery Babylon. And the Greek word translated mystery is a little bit different. We think of mystery, we think of uh, uh, one of the mystery shows, you know, on Hallmark Channel or something like that. But the word mystery in the, in the Greek, musterion, refers to something that has been unrevealed in the past, but at the moment that it's called a mystery and presented, it's being revealed in the present. So uh, verse 5 calls her a mystery. In other words, at the point that John sees it. He, remember, he's exiled on the Isle of Patmos by the Roman emperor because of his preaching in the church at Ephesus. So John is there exiled, and God decides to use him while he's in an exile status and use him to present what's going to happen in world history in the future. So it represents a phase of development heretofore unrevealed. So let me uh, review the five Number one, characterized as a harlot, verses one and two, and verses 15 and 16. Number two, it is a system leading ecclesiastical affairs, verses two and five. Number three, it is a leader in political affairs, verse three. Number four, it accumulates great wealth and great influence, verse four. And the number five, it represents a phase of development heretofore unrevealed. And then number six, it has been the great persecutor of the saints. Remember, there are people in the tribulation period who are going to be responding to Christ, to the message of Christ, and they will turn to him for salvation. And when they get to the end of the tribulation period, they will remain in their physical bodies and go into the earthly kingdom. But if they, if this uh, religious system has been a great persecutor of the saints. Look at verse 6. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the idea of I wondered with great admiration, it carries with it the idea of being stunned, confused, and marveling over what he's seeing here. So it had been the great persecutor of the saints, verse six, and then number seven, it is an organized system with worldwide scope. It is an organized system with worldwide scope. Look at verse 15 again. And he said to me, the waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And then he goes on and describes the ten horns and so forth as the nations there. So it's going to be a worldwide system. And then number eight, it will eventually be destroyed by the beast. And why is that? See, the beast is the head of the Roman coalition, so his own supremacy will not be threatened. So this is true if you read this history of socialism. Normally, the people who turn a country into a socialistic country, they are very close to the leaders they promoted. And the first group to be attacked after these leaders get in power is the group that helped them get them supported. Read the rise and fall of the uh, communist 
foundation. You'll see how that worked with Karl Marx and everything. But when a, when a socialist or the country turns socialist, it has to do so because it has a large number of powerful people pushing its leaders to socialism to the top. Once they get to the top, they feel threatened by the people that helped them get there. So that, that's the first group they turn on historically, okay? Now, that same thing will happen with the beast. He will use the Babylonian empire and the Babylonian religion to promote himself and get worldwide worship. And then according to this passage right here that he will say, verses 16 and 17, he will turn immediately on this religious system and destroy it. And the false prophet will then force everybody to worship the beast himself, who will be seated in the uh, Jewish temple in the middle of the tribulation period. So the great harlot, or the whore, as the King James refers to her, is in fact a false religious system which is tightly linked to Babylonianism. Years ago, one of my favorite uh, um, authors to read was Harry Ironside. And he wrote a book entitled Lectures on the Book of Revelation. Let me read you what he says, pages 287 to 295, but I've Cut it down a little bit so I don't have to read all the pages to you. But listen to what he says. Quoting now, The woman is a religious system who dominates the civil power, at least for a time. The founder of Babylon was Nimrod, whose unholy achievements we read about in the 10th chapter of Genesis. End of quotation. Conservative scholars identify Nimrod, he says, Harry Ironside says, as the arch apostate of the patriarchal age, in a quotation. He was behind building the Tower of Babel. And remember, the, the arrogant boast was, we'll build us a tower into the heavens, you know, and challenge God. And actually, the word Babel means the gate of God. So Ironside concludes this on uh, in, uh, page two, 295. Here's what he says. An imitation of that which is real and true has ever since characterized Babylon in all ages. End of quote. J. Dwight Pentecost caused in Things to Come, page 364, uh, concludes that the church, the bride of Christ, is not present in the tribulation. And he focuses on Daniel's 70th week as being designed. To, uh, to deal with Israel, not with the church. And here's what he says on page 364. The unbelieving, professing church went into the tribulation period. Now catch that. Unbelieving profession. In other words, these weren't true Christians. These were just people that claimed to be Christians in the general sense, okay? They had never experienced a new birth or they would have already been gone. So the unbelieving professing, not possessing, the professing church went into the tribulation period and a great religious system under the domination of the great harlot arose, end of quotation. So the religious system then in the seven years of tribulation is a corrupt imitation of Christianity. It's not genuine Christianity at all, but it will use whatever Christian principles will help promote its immediate cause. So in his section where he concludes identifying the great whore on the beast, J. Dwight Pentecost says, and once again I'm quoting from page 368 of Things to Come, it is thus concluded that the harlot represents all professing Christendom united in a single system under one head. End of quotation. John Walburn also believes the religion represented by the great harlot resembles an imitation of some fashion of Christendom. Here's what he says, page 585 and 586 of every prophecy in the Bible. He says, quoting now, the great prostitute described in these verses is a portrayal of apostate Christendom in the end time. When the rapture occurs, all true believers are caught up to be with the Lord but left behind are many thousands of those who made some profession of faith in Christ and claimed to be Christians in a general sense, 
but who were never born again. These will constitute the apostate church, which will dominate the scene politically and religiously up to the midpoint of the last seven years before the second coming of Jesus Christ. End of quotation. Warren Wiersbe also sees a combination of weak Christendom and Babylonianism imitating the true church. Here's what he says, Bible expository commentary, page 613. He said, the Babylonian system of false religion has been a part of history since Nimrod founded his empire. Scholars have discovered it is amazingly like the true Christian faith. Alas, it is Satan's counterfeit of God's truth. Babylonians practiced the worship of a mother and a child and even believed in the death and resurrection of her son. End of quotation. Remember, if Satan's imitations are to deceive, they must be almost indistinguishable from that which is genuine. The best way to sell error is to sell it as truth. So in looking at this woman riding on the scarlet colored beast, we are seeing what we called an inspired depiction by the Holy Spirit of a corrupt religious system which eventually leads to the recognition of the first beast, Revelation 13, as God promoting worship of him worldwide. The second beast in Revelation 13 is the false prophet, and he promotes this false religion, guiding it to full recognition of the Antichrist as God sitting in the rebuilt Jewish temple. So that's the woman who's riding on the beast. Now exactly who is the beast? What is the beast? And then how, when we look at both of them, how does it tell us in the text that we just read, how does it tell us they will be working together to promote this worldwide religion? Well, the reminder is that if you know Jesus Christ personally, I don't mean are you religious, I don't mean if you've been baptized into something, I don't mean that, I mean if you've ever experienced a new birth, you're safe. You know, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 tell us, that when Jesus descends with the archangel and the shout and the trumpet, that immediately those that, who have died, who have really been born again, they're going to be taken out of their graves and changed. Those that are left on the earth who are genuinely born again are going to be changed and taken up with them. And the Bible says, we sh so shall we ever be with the Lord. Well, the only way you can have that guarantee is to be sure that you know the Lord personally, not that you're religious. Not that you are a Christian in the general sense, but that you know the Lord personally. So the invitation will be open. We'll open the altar. If God spoke into your heart, you need to come. Please do so. Let's stand together for prayer. Lord, we're so grateful <clears throat> that you've already told us how things are going to turn out. And we're so grateful that you've given us an invitation that will allow us to choose the right side to be on when things do turn out the way you say they're going to turn out. We thank you for the hope that we have in Christ. We thank you for the promise of eternity with you through the new birth. We ask you to speak to our hearts now as we sing the invitation, open the altar in Jesus' name. Amen. What page? 639. 639. God spoke into your heart. The altar is open if you need to come. 639. <laughs>
soul upon my heart and then Paul lead us in prayer.